Hi, welcome to CJC Online Church. And it's good that you can join us here. And we welcome you, of course. We'd like you to like, share, and subscribe. For those who don't know, when you like the program, you actually help us to get to the top of the YouTube algorithm. When you share our program, of course, you allow others to come to know the truth of God's Word and, of course, the things that affect their lives. And, of course, every time that you subscribe, every time that we go live, you are notified, especially if you click that notification bell. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're coming live from the Portmore Massive Count down to the end series right here at Smith Boulevard opposite the JUTC bus park and of course it's three very massive tents and a fourth smaller one as individuals have been blessed by the word of God and therefore our talk priorities Q&A segment will be followed by our talk priorities segment we're going to focus on the gift of prophecy and after that we're going to have a wonderful infectious service for our pathfinders for those who don't know our Pathfinder program is key to the development of our young people. And once they are part of it, it provides that level of discipline, that level of knowledge, and that connection with God. So this afternoon will be a very packed afternoon as we look at God's abundant blessings. Of course, for those who are here and those who are online, remember that your questions can be posted in the chat, and we will seek to answer your questions today, and if not today, at our next Talk Priorities Question and Agreement segment. So welcome, 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 and we're very happy that you are here. And of course, I'm very happy that we have uh, our live audience here as well. I invite you this time to bow your heads as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful to you that you've allowed your word and your truth to impact our hearts and our lives. We pray that you may be with us as we go into this segment and that you'll continue to bless, lead, and guide us. We thank you for the immense blessings and we pray that once again you will shower down your blessing upon us as we wait on you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, so welcome, welcome. I'm seeing Marcia W. online. Welcome, I'm seeing Patsy Pitt online. Welcome, I'm seeing Barbara Robinson from Cayman. Welcome, I'm seeing Denise Alexander. Welcome, 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 welcome. We're very, very happy that you are here. Now, because we have uh, uh, missed out on a number of Q&A segments, there are some questions uh, that came from our very first Talk priorities here under the tent. For those who don't know, um, the very first priorities here in Portmore, we looked at the health message and we look at what God had in store for his people. And there are some questions that came from that segment. Our second talk priorities came about family relationship with Dr. Anthony Gordon, and we're grateful for those questions also. So let's dive into the questions that came up from uh, the previous talk priorities on health. So in the talk priorities on health, I welcome Pauline. Uh, we are still counting that baptism is still going on at this time, Pauline. So we'll let you know that answer shortly. Pauline is asking online, what is the baptismal number? We'll soon get to that answer. All right. So in the previous program, we mentioned that the animals that you can eat in the Bible are animals that eat plants. And we mentioned that you don't want to eat animals that eat other animals because, uh, of course, that is going to be unhealthy for you and the Bible actually tells you not to. So a question that came was that, so fish eat what? And uh, I, the answer to that is, and this is just for biology, um, the fish that has fins and scales tend to eat Plankton, which is the plant based in the oceans or rivers. Now, the person actually wanted to be specific about a particular fish, and the person mentioned barracuda. Now, anybody here eat bar barracuda? Anybody eat barracuda? Yes? 
Ah. No, I have never eaten that fish in all my life. So I had to go and research the fish. And uh, the fish has fins and scales. But barracudas are not the regular fish and scales because they do hunt and they do eat other fish. So does that mean, therefore, we can't eat barracudas? Now, what I found is that the World Health Organization does have a problem with barracuda. They said that barracuda does have a toxin in it that, is, that can affect human beings and affect our nervous system. And therefore, they recommend that you don't eat barracudas. So there you go. So barracuda is something that you may need to avoid because of the level of toxins that are in that particular fish. Another fish that you should definitely avoid um, is the ones that have the spikes on it. Remember that one? Lionfish. Yes, lionfish. You need to avoid lionfish also. They are not really good for you. I know persons who can take out the spikes and uh, it's tender and it's nice, but it's not something that you really want to, to consume. Regular fish. You know what regular fish are? Give me some nice regular fish you can eat. Snapper, exactly. Some nice snapper. What else? Some parrot. Dr. Fish. No, Dr. Fish, the numbers were going down a little bit, so they were trying to kind of save them. It and the parrot. Hopefully it's back up, but everybody knows that those fish, when you eat them, they taste really, really good, don't it? Mm? All right? So your snapper, your tilapia. No, I know this question didn't came in, but persons always ask about sardine and mackerel. Are those edible fish? Sardines and mackerel? No? Why you say no? It has fins? Does sardine have fins? Okay. Does sardine have scales? Yes, they do. Now, sardine and mackerel belong to a, a particular group of fish that whenever they are caught or they're scared, they tend to shed their scales to try and get slippery enough to get away from their predators. And that's why you hardly find scales within your sardine or find scales within your mackerel. And if you're old enough and you used to when mackerel was called, can I see this online? Is this okay? Um, Dutty girl. Mm? When it was called that, uh, you will find, occasionally you'll find scales in there. But now that we have become more refined, you will not find any in there. So, yes. So it's okay to eat sardine and mackerel. And somebody online is saying it's okay to eat salmon. Somebody says the jackfish, the parrotfish. Um, tilapias, definitely. Tuna, definitely. Um, those are, are fish. What about sawfish? Does sawfish have fins and scales? Yes. yes, it does. Yes, it does. Sawfish is codfish and therefore should be grown in uh, cold climates. And that's where you get your, your cod liver oil that gives you your omega fats. All right? For those who take fish oil, that's where it comes from. All right, so that clears up that. As it relates to animals, remember the animal or your mammal must be a herbivore. That means they only eat plants. They only eat plants. The only exception is horses. Horses eat plants, eat hay and grass. However, horse is unclean to you. So the Bible says uh, the animal, the mammal, must divide the hoof and chew the cud. So to chew the cud, you have to be a herbivore or a vegetarian animal. Because the idea is that as you chew, you will break up the, the grass, which is very hard to digest. It will go down and it will come back up and it will go down. That's why they chew the cud. They're chewing it several times to get the nutrients from grass. So therefore, they are going to be herbivores. So a horse chew the cud, but horses do not divide the hoof. So it's unclean. And God knew why it was unclean. And that is why we don't eat horse meat. Horse meat is actually very unhealthy. We don't. You don't find anybody really eating horse meat. And the last time that an attempt was 
made to mix horse meat with beef, it led to a worldwide scare because horse meat is not something that you should consume. You see, God always knows best. Amen? He designed us so he knows what we can and cannot eat. All right, so is it okay to eat salt mackerel? So that is from Jenny's. So Jenny's, mackerel is okay, but the, the, the salt is what is used to cure it or to keep it. So it's like how, so anything you have too much salt uh, may not be good for you. Does that make sense? So with your salt fish, you have to boil the salt fish first. Mm? Until the salt fish become fresh fish. Then you can eat it. Does that make sense? Salt mackerel is the same problem. So you need to avoid the number of salt that you have uh, um, and try to reduce that because you don't want to have uh, hypertension. All right, another question that came in was, I mentioned not to drink green tea. Green tea. Does anybody remember why you shouldn't drink green tea? Caffeine. Caffeine. Excellent. So caffeine was the number one reason why you should not drink green tea. No, somebody then asked, so does, that, does green tea mean green bush tea? The answer is no. All right? Green tea is the name of the tea. Your bush tea is your bush tea, like your Cersei tea. Mm? That's bush tea. Okay? Your sour sap leaf tea. That's a bush tea. All right? So green tea is green tea, and it's actually filled with caffeine, and you should not eat it. I'm going to say this as my time wraps up, and welcome, Barbara. My time wraps up. Listen carefully. Listen carefully to this. When you're taking bush tea, be very careful. Okay? So if the bush tea is still green, you can use about five leaves. If the bush tea is dried, you have to use less. And Cersei, Cersei, though a good bitter herb that helps with your liver, Cersei can actually damage your liver and give you cirrhosis of the liver. So, Everything that you do, you have to do it in what? Moderation. You have to be temperate in all things. So be careful of the bush tea. Be careful of the amount you use. You can't use too much, else you will damage your own system. All right. So that's all the time that we have. It's 3.45. We're going to go into our talk priorities, looking at the gift of prophecy. So as I welcome Gabby, as I welcome Donna from New York, as I welcome Janet. Um, oh, Janet, we already answered the question already. Janet is asking, does mackerel have scales? And the answer is yes, Janet. As we welcome Dr. Clark. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for joining. We're going to go into our talk priorities at this time as we look at the gift of prophecy. You really have to stay and make sure that you get a full understanding why we as Seventh-day Adventists embrace the gift of prophecy as identified in Ellen G. White. So just after the break, talk priorities will resume. Talk priorities is in keeping with our mission, proclaiming the everlasting gospel through the publishing ministry. And it's against this background, ladies and gentlemen, why we have chosen this medium to share with you some hidden treasures in our priority magazines. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is quite interesting. We don't necessarily have to close our eyes to pray because you can't even tell the deaf to close their eyes when they pray. <laughs> I mean, they have to see what's happening. The Son of God died. Yes. And nobody ever denied that. Yeah, that's it. But still yet today, there are persons who believe that there are certain folks who can't die. Even right here in Jamaica, some of them are going to say, no man, they are Cuba man, they're not dying. They don't believe. 
Anytime you ask, accept Christ, your life will be disrupted. There's really no convenient time. So there's no antidepressant drug that's better than exercise and mild to moderate depression. And it has almost no side effects. So sometimes we're so overburdened with work and all the activities that we're doing that, you know, even the dog will cuss. <laughs> even the <laughs> puss at all will throw something at Place him in the Garden of Eden. You're saying that he was not supposed to sweat at that time. Right? Sweat so he was not a part of it, right? He worked, but he didn't sweat. He worked, but, but he, he didn't, didn't sweat. sweat. That, that, that's that. We don't go there saying about that. And especially as Christians, Master. Sometimes we overspend that we spend in the Lord's money. You know, when person said to me, what are you doing? You're looking so young. I said, oh, Jesus is just helping me. <laughs> so stay tuned and stay with us every Sabbath. And invite your friends as we look at biblical, theological, doctrinal, health, and social issues that are of priority to us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome again to another ep ep uh, presentation in the series of Talk Priority. We are happy to have you joining us again this afternoon. I do hope and trust that you had a wonderful Sabbath morning this morning. We had a great time right here under the tent. Dr. Sean O'Connor delivered God's word with clarity and conviction, and we were blessed today. And a number of persons surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ uh, this afternoon, and we're rejoicing with them. You will get the figure later on, but we're rejoicing. People are just giving their life to the Lord. And I would just want to appeal to you if you're out there, if you have been watching this series night of tonight and on Sabbath, and the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart, then you need to make that decision for Jesus Christ. Because one of these days, you know, my brothers and sisters, the preaching of the gospel will come to an end. One of these days, the call uh, to surrender to Jesus Christ will come to an end. And we don't know what will happen after this series. We don't even know whether or not we will live to see the end of this series. It's countdown to the end evangelistic series. And the man of God has been delivering God's word with clarity and power. We thank God for him. We thank God for the ministry of Dr. Sharon O'Connor. And we're happy that you have joined us. Those of you who are under the tent uh, this afternoon and those who have joined us online, we welcome you to another series, Talk Priority. As you all know, this is a mission-driven initiative of the church, the Inter-American Division, as we focus on our, our priority magazine. And a number of uh, information is there, rather uh, a lot of, of facts and, uh, and, and the real juicy stuff are there in the magazine. And we try to unearth that here on our Talk Priority uh, platform. And you can, uh, of course, be engaged in, in the doctrinal and theological uh, subjects and health and social issues that we deal with right here. So if you're joining us for the first time, ensure that you, you, you are subscribed and be a part of Central Jamaica Conference Talk Priority Program every Sabbath afternoon at 3.30. Now, we're a little late this evening because of the, of the baptism or crusade and a baptism. And so we come into a little later this afternoon. But normally we come on at 3.30 for our Talk Priority program and our Q&A at 3. Uh, but we're happy. We want to say thanks to Dr. Douglas for leading out uh, this afternoon for a short while in our Q&A segment. And you will hear him going forward every Sabbath afternoon at 3 uh, p.m. Well, 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, this evening we have a very interesting topic that we want to look at. We talk about the gift of prophecy, and I'm happy to have joining me this afternoon uh, Dr. Kemar Douglas. You heard from him earlier, no stranger to us and Talk Priority, our health ministry director here at Central Jamaica Conference, as well as our public affairs and religious liberty and the Spirit of Prophecy Director. And so we're happy to have you. Welcome again, Dr. Douglas. Thank you, Pastor Barry. You, you know, you're a blessed person. The Lord has used you in so many different ways. And you're always there. You're always responding when we call upon you. You're always there to help with the mission. We're happy to have you, sir. Thank you for joining us again for Talk Priority. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, also, we have joining us uh, Pastor Pastor Damien Chambers. Now, Pastor Chambers has served this church for a number of years as pastor right here in Central Jamaica Conference. He served as communication and health ministry director of our conference as well as assistant to the president for evangelism and also public affairs and religious liberty at one point. He has served this conference with distinction and then he was called to serve at Northern Caribbean University as the associate professor in the Department of Religion and Theology. And we are happy to have you. Welcome, Doctor. Uh, and I'm speaking that into being because it's in short order. And she will be graduated from your doctoral studies. So we happy to have you on Talk Priority, Pastor Chambers. Thank you very much, Pastor Barrett. I'm so delighted to be here. And good afternoon and happy Sabbath to your listeners, viewers, and to Dr. Douglas as well. And we know we're going to be having you again because we had the KG Vaz Lecture Series, ladies and gentlemen, just on Thursday of this week, a very interesting topic. And we want to have that topic right on Talk Priority. And it so happened that you were one of the presenters. Dr. Douglas uh, was one of the pre presenters. And so that topic is very interesting. And we want to have that right here on our Talk Priority. And that we will make that uh, uh, series one, part one and two because there's a lot to be discussed. And we're looking forward to that. You're going to enjoy it, ladies and gentlemen. But, you know, I'm so happy because both of you serve as communication director at Central Jamaica Conference. Huh? And both of you serve as health ministry director at Central Jamaica Conference. Both of you serve as public affairs and religious liberty and spirit of prophecy at Central Jamaica Conference. So what better person I could have on set, ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon to discuss this very important uh, topic, uh, the gift of prophecy. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and we want to dive into it now because we have a very interesting program coming up after this with our young people, and we want to give them the time to go through their program. So, uh, up front, uh, gentlemen, uh, spirit, the gift of prophecy. Uh, what is the Seventh-day Adventist uh, position on that, on the gift of prophecy? The Lord in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, told Moses and Miriam and the children of Israel that if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a dream and will speak unto him in a vision. The gift of prophecy is a means by which God speaks to his people definitively. And the Seventh day Adventist Church um, views it as one of the spiritual gifts. It is also within the context of the last day church, one of the identifying marks of the remnant church based on Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And we believe emphatically that this gift was manifested in the life of Ellen G. White, who helped to guide, inspire, and comfort the church. But at the end of the day, the gift of prophecy is that spiritual gift by which God speaks to his church. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. Want to chip on it that? It is one of the most pivotal part of our church and our organization and our success to date. Um, for those who would like to go back and watch our convention presentations, Pastor Barrett, we did discuss how relevant this gift is to our church. Without the gift of prophecy, what we now benefit from, we would not have, including our publishing work our education work, our health ministry's work, all that came through the gift of prophecy that gave this church the level of success that it now enjoys today. Oh, that's, that's profound. So you would also, is it fair to conclude that 
Had it not been for the gift of prophecy, we wouldn't be here at Seventh Day Adventist. We wouldn't be here. Okay. Even the name that we have, Seventh Day Adventist, came because of that gift. Okay. If it wasn't for that gift, we would we would have been called Church of God Seventh Day or something like that. Okay. Thank you very much. So, oh, um, why does uh, Seventh Day Adventist believe that that prophecy is so important uh, for us in these last days? Yes. Um, the the church from the beginning has always been guided by prophecy. Mm -hmm. it, 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 God in different eras have answered the questions of his people by telling them about the future. And there's a lineage of prophecy that needs to be continued throughout history, throughout the church. Even Jesus, when he came here, he recognized the work of the prophets before him. John the Baptist was the one who brought him in. One of, one of my favorite examples of this is the Apostle Peter. Peter said that we were eyewitnesses mm -hmm. of his majesty. And yet, he says, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. So even though he was an eyewitness, he depended on the witness of the prophet to testify about the truth of God's word. So the gift of prophecy helps us as a people, God's church, to know what our duty is in these last days. Okay. And because there are many varied and varied views about it, Jesus spoke about false Christ and false prophets who would arise. We need to know where our feet stands, and the gift of prophecy helps to guide our feet in that direction. Okay, that's, that's very important, uh, Pastor Chambers. So it behooves us, therefore, as Adventists to, to be aware of what's happening around us. If, if prophecy is so crucial to us in the last days, then we, we need to be uh, aware and, and look at uh, the signs that are taking place around us. Because if we so believe in prophecy, then we must be looking out for the fulfillment of prophecy. Amen. Right, Dr. Douglas? And I have to agree with you. And I'm going to use the COVID pandemic as a good illustration. Yes. When the COVID pandemic came, people were saying, oh, this is the end of the world. Um, they're going to change our, our biological nature. We're going to take away our rights. And it's the mark of the beast with the vaccine. They went through all of that. But anyone who was a good seven-day Adventist, who was looking at prophecy and reading the great controversy would have recognized that COVID pandemic is not how the world would end. Okay. That's not what would have happened. So it does provide the church with a prophetic understanding for the last days. And once you have gone through that gift, you will know exactly what to expect and what is to come upon the world. So it is an excellent source so for... So while we talk about... Oh, you're going to say... If you'll allow me, Pastor Barrett. Yes. So persons may be asking, why do we need the gift of prophecy when we have the Bible? Because yes. of a truth, it is the Bible that should give us the direction that we need. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you look at the book of Revelation chapter 11, the Bible prophesies that the word of God, the gift of prophecy, would prophesy in sackcloth and ashes for 1260 years. Mm -hmm. it would, it would, the Bible would be kept from the people um, for the most part. And we refer to that as the dark ages. Mm -hmm. after, immediately after the dark ages, the Bible also tells us that a beast that came out of the bottomless pit will attack the Bible again. Right. Which refers to the French Revolution that is that the result of the Enlightenment. So there are several factors that were clothed in the scriptures starting from the Dark Age, the apostles of the Dark Age, to the Enlightenment, and to liberalism in the modern time. Because history tells us that just about the time that Sim Devine's church was coming up, Charles Darwin came up with the theory of evolution. Okay. So even though the Bible is there, God saw it fit from the beginning that his remnant church would need this special, a manifestation of this special gift to be able to discern exactly what the Bible is saying because there is so much confusion that's going on. Uh, very, very important because at the beginning you did point out that it's the means by which God communicates to these people, Amen. gift of prophecy. And that's exactly what we see manifesting here in your utterances thus far. Dr. Douglas. I'm going to go to another text in Revelation chapter 10. And this has to do with the great disappointment. For those who need to go back to that, I think Pastor O'Connor preached on that recently. In the great disappointment, the Bible records that this will happen. Verse 9 says, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. 
And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be sweet in thy mouth. And I took the book of the angel hand, and ate it up, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, it was bitter in my belly. And that was the great disappointment. It was sweet. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. But when God didn't come, it was now bitter in the belly. And then the final verse then says, verse 11 says, and he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Here we find the Bible saying there must be a prophet that should arise after this appointment to guide the people in, and it shall be treated in tongues and nations, and that's why the gift is so. So, important. having said that, what it ties in beautifully with what um, a Prophet Joel says. How do you tie that in with, with what uh, Joel said, Joel 2 28 and 20, 29? Just before we get to that, that I need to spin off, spin off from what Dr. Douglas has said. The great disappointment would have destroyed the church. If it wasn't for the gift of prophecy. Amen. I love that. <laughs> Say that again. There is so much, the greatest appointment would have destroyed the church if it wasn't for the gift of prophecy. Because there is so much confusion that went on during that time. Number two, as a result of the great disappointment and other such disappointments, the Protestant churches who through the prophecy and the word of prophecy was able to identify the beasts, Yes. And to you to study prophecy based on the year to day principle, most Protestant churches, except for the Advanced Church, discarded with that type of interpretation of prophecy. Yes. And so God needed clear, the church needed clear evidence that this is the right way to go. As a matter of fact, anyway, first vision shows us. So, do you want to come to that? <laughs> hold on to that a little bit. I, so, I you mentioned... going there, like I want to say, okay, hold a little bit. So, let me hold you a little bit. Let's go to Joel. To, we want to deal with a few points before we get to where you're at, okay? Yes, Dr. You mentioned Dr. Joel. Joel 2, verse 20 and 29. And it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the service upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. So, and we're living in those days. Now. We're living in and, those and days. And what you say, that your young men shall what? Prophesy. Yes. Which means that they're still prophets. Ah, so uh, watch uh, this now. There's, uh, a, there's something very interesting with it, how Ellen White came to be the prophet. They don't reach it yet. I oh, want, all right, all right. I want, the, the, the point here in the text means that if, if the Bible says, right, that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, uh, who prophesy? A prophet. Yes. So if we're in the last days, that means there are still some prophets. So could there be false prophets out there and some genuine prophets, people? Uh, t tell us about that, right? Uh, yes. How do we test the prophet? You know, whether or not, because a lot of people come up these days and say they are prophet, uh, prophetess and they have a message from the Lord and they have a message for you and, and so forth. How do we ascertain? And a lot of preachers today were preaching and calling themselves prophets of our time and all of that. How do we uh, identify whether or not they are true or false prophets? So the Bible does speak to the fact that there will be false Christ said there will be false prophets in the last days. That's a, that's a sign of his coming. Yeah. And therefore we have to test the prophet. So one of the greatest tests of the prophet is does this prophet agree with the Bible? Okay. Any prophet that comes and says, oh, the Bible is old and it's, it's to be done away with and the word that I have now is fresh word, forget the Bible. And the Bible, by Bible I mean Old and New Testament, that person can't be a prophet. Not, not, just, not just the Psalms and the New Testament. It has to be the entire Bible. Okay. Isaiah 8 verse 20 says, and Isaiah was specific. No, Isaiah did not have New Testament. So Isaiah said, to the law, which is the first five, the Torah, and to the testimony, which is the rest of the Old Testament, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Mm -hmm. So any prophet will come and say, okay, Old Testament? Old Testament is old stuff, man. I don't need any more. Isaiah is saying, hey, if you are saying that, you know, about the law and the, and the prophets, there's no light in you. 
Yeah. Just forget you. You're not the prophet of God. You have to be in accordance with God's word. And uh, very good. Uh, and that. that's what the apostle Paul said that if, if an, even an angel comes and speaks something different, let him be accursed. So you also have um, the prophet's word must come to pass. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21 22. Uh, it says, And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow it not, nor come to pass, that is a thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken presumptuously. Um, that's another test of the prophet. You also have 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, which said that you must try the spirits, whether they be of God or of, the, or of man, any spirit that doesn't confess that Christ came in the flesh. Referring to the idea that they must, because Christ is the center for salvation. Yes. So the, 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 the prophet's work must not, must not just be just to predict the future willy-nilly, to give it a lot of number and so on. It is about <laughs> testifying about Jesus and pointing to Christ as a source of our salvation. Let me just drop in right there because there are a lot of persons who don't understand the incarnation of Christ. And they will tell you that Christ is not God or Christ was just a man or Christ was just a prophet. For you to be a prophet of God, you must believe that God became man, that Christ was the incarnate, the embodiment of God. You have to believe that, that he was a son of God. And there are some who are debating, oh, he's not the son of God, he's not God, he's just a little demigod, he's a half a God. There are some churches that call him, he's not the God, them say, he is a God, trying to okay. demote him. That does not work. You have to believe, a prophet has to believe that Christ is the incarnate, that his name stands, uh, God with us. Okay, now this is getting warm. It's very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what our guests are sharing with us in order for us to test the prophet, whether or not they're true. There are a few things that we need to look for. One, uh, does the message agree with the Bible? Uh, the Old and the New Testament, as uh, you had a KG Vaz lecture series the other day, you know, the one thing I can always remember uh, from Dr. Vaz is say the, the Old Testament. Celebrations, choices. Life is full of choices. Every day you... Said the Old Testament is the New Testament enfolded. And the New Testament is the Old Testament unfolded. Perfect. And so that's very important, right? Yes. So a prophet must know that, right? Very important. And number two, he said, uh, the, uh, the, the, whatever the, the prophet predicts must, must come to pass, right? If it doesn't, it's a false prophet. And this person must accept Jesus Christ and his incarnation, right? He came and he, his God came and he took on to himself human flesh and he died for us. You must... If you are not testifying of the goodness of God through Jesus Christ, if you don't believe that is Jesus Christ, then something is fundamentally wrong. And number two, um, the prophet must do what? Bear good fruit. Of course. The prophet so must one. bear good fruit. You can't be a prophet and, uh, and you're producing a lot of bad fruit and uh, bad things are happening where you're going and bad things will come from what you say. You must be able to bear fruit. Matthew 7, verse 6 to 20 says, You shall know them by their fruits. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. The prophet must be bearing good fruit. Okay. The prophets were not perfect. Yes. But the trajectory of their lives must be in harmony with their teaching. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the important thing. And you, you can know that for modern day prophets. They, are, they, are, they have the gift, so to speak, and tell you things, but their lives are in total conflict with what the scripture teaches. But can you imagine, because if as normal Christians, we have a responsibility to represent the God that we serve, right? Just living for him. And say so we believe and we're living for him. Let alone the mouthpiece for God. <laughs> You have to have that relationship. Your, your lifestyle, your words, your conduct, your behavior, your mannerism, everything must depict godliness and godlikeness. It must speak to the fact that you have a relationship with him, that you communicate with him, so your life must bear fruit of the 
as evidence of your relationship with God. Amen. So all those points, ladies and gentlemen, four important points we need to take note of. So when individuals come and say, I'm a prophet from God, or I have a message, I had a vision. You know, a lot of people do that. They talk like that. I got a vision. They're willing to share. But what is extremely important is how their lives line up with what they are saying. Amen. Right? That's very important. Uh, I think it, it's... Uh, it's time for us to take a break, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to take uh, a break and we'll get back to you in a little bit. We're happy to have you joining us. Uh, we'll take a break at this time. Celebrations, choices. Life is full of choices. Every day you make countless decisions, all adding up to determine the overall fabric of your life and to a large extent, your health. Everyone has to deal with the consequences of their choices, but with the abundance of options to choose from, it's easy to forget about the impact they have. The good news is there's a solution. The key to decision-making is intentionality. Intentionality means making evidence-based decisions. It gives direction and order to your life. Considering your choices with intentionality brings you one step closer to doing the right thing for your health, regardless of the choices you've already made. Today is an opportunity to choose better, to start fresh. You may not be able to change the consequences of your past decisions, but that's okay. You can choose to get over your mistakes and live better from now on. Invite God to be part of your decisions. Ask Him to help you make the right choice. All the persons participating in the program, Pathfinders, Adventurers, please meet us at the back. Okay, thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are here with our guest, Dr. Kemar Douglas, and also Associate Professor, Pastor Damien Chambers, as we look at the gift of prophecy. A while ago, we talked about some of the tests of the prophets, about message, um, must agree with the Bible. We talked about the, the prediction that ought to come through and the person believed in the, in the one and only true God, the Son, Jesus Christ, came to earth, died for our sins, etc., and must testify of Jesus Christ and the Incarnation, and also that the fruits of the prophet. Now, uh, we do have uh, someone online, Dr. Doug, yes. if you want to. Dr. Clark is asking, what's an example of good fruit? Now, to answer that question, um, the Bible speaks to the fact that the Holy Spirit gives us the fruit, or the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. So love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So the prophet must bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit that gives the prophet the gift of prophecy. Also, whatever the prophet speaks to, it must stand. So therefore, if they, like Isaiah, his, we don't know Isaiah today. We have never seen Isaiah. Mm -mm. But his fruit, his word, still gives us meaning in life today. And Isaiah is a powerful prophet because Isaiah was both for his people. He was both for Christ, Messianic, and he was both for the end time. So therefore, he's a powerful prophet. And therefore, his fruit still remains today for us to benefit from, even though we have never met the man. And therefore, that's how the fruit should be interpreted. Both the fruit of the Spirit and what they produce should still be effective even after their passing. Okay, thank you. Um, so earlier on, we were talking about Ellen White, right? We just talked about the test of the prophet. And uh, earlier on, you made reference to, to Ellen G. White. So tell us, who is Ellen White? Or who was Ellen White? And did she actually uh, pass the test of the prophets? Ellen G. White is uh, the former Ellen Harmon. She's actually a twin. Mm -hmm. um, she was born in 1827 to her parents who were members of the Methodist Church. During that time, the Methodist, Baptist, Christian Connections, they were the Protestant movement at the time. 
and um, the Millerite movement was very active. Her parents became part of the Millerite movement and um, she joined as well. And at about age nine, she met in an accident mm -hmm. that caused her to stop from school. And um, so from, her, from that time, she had never been to school up until that time. But being a part of the Millerite movement, she also experienced a great disappointment. And uh, after the great disappointment, as the men wrestled with the question of where God is leading them, she received a vision in December 1840, um, for the same year, 44, 1844, and um, she received her first vision, reluctantly accepted a call to be a prophet. And yes, she does meet and pass. But before you before even go into uh, examples of, of um, for Ellen White having met it, you said something a while ago that's so important, uh, Pastor Chambers, is that obviously she never had that formal schooling that many of us would have gone through, right? And God called her, he chose her and would have used her in such a marked way. What a God we serve. Amen. Means it's, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to think about it because she was not the first person that was actually given a vision. Yes. So after this appointment, one of the Millerite members was walking through a, a, cane, a cornfield, Aaron Epstein, and he got a vision that explained uh, the whole great disappointment. After him, it's recorded, so he was an old man. But before you touch that, Ted, <laughs> No, I'm yeah. trying to explain Joel, what Joel said. So you had the old man, yeah, but, then but, you had but, the young before man. Before you go there, <laughs> not, sorry to just interrupt you, but what I want it to sink in first is there are a lot of people today who feel that they are no good, they miss out on life and life's opportunities yes. and, and uh, God can't use them. This is the point I want to really drive home for all members here, our visitors and those of you who are online. Sometimes we really condemn ourselves. We feel like we never made it. We have never been through a system and all of that and we are, we are no good. But, but, but God calls individuals. It doesn't matter, matter what level of education you had or what you have or how society sees you. When God chooses you, you're well chosen. And that's what I want to emphasize about this person. And, and that's what I'm coming right to, to because God has to choose you, but you have to also choose to follow God. Yes. Because another person was chosen before her. A young black man was chosen, and his response was, I am black, they won't listen to me. So he right. found excuses. When God chose Ellen White, Ellen yeah. White didn't find an excuse. Yeah. She simply accepted that she shared her vision, though timidly at first, but she shared it. This young lady who had uh, no formal education per se beyond grade or uh, age nine, suffering because she got hit and therefore she, did, she didn't look as her twin sister who was pretty. She didn't look like her anymore because of deformity. And she decided, despite my physical deformity, despite my lack of education, despite the fact I, didn't, I wasn't out there like my, my sister, I am gonna still do what the Lord has called me to do. And that is the beauty of it. Wherever you are, whatever you have, Give it to the Lord. Amen. God can use you in a mark way. Now go back to the test now as we're talking. And she has written over 100,000 pages of content. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful of the church. Now um, there are four tests that we discussed earlier. Um, the first one, does her writings agree with the Bible? And anyone with an honest heart who study her writings will know that she not only exalts the Bible, but she agrees with the Bible on the fundamental teachings of Scripture um, about Christ, about, about uh, the church, um, about the nature of man, about sin. She, she, she agrees with the Bible, yes. You use the word honest, but I will also say that there are persons who don't like Ellen White who has dived into her writings to try and find something that says that she disagrees with the Bible and they cannot find anything in her writing that says she's against the Word of God. So it's not just those with an honest heart, you know. You have those who are seeking for information to destroy her and they still can't find it in her writing because she agrees with the Word of God. Okay, I, I love that. Regarding predictions, yeah. um, as a prophet, her main work was not to predict the future as such. Her main work was to enlighten the scripture and to guide the church. But there are some things that she said 
that we could use to indicate that she's truly a prophet. For example, the rise of spiritualism. When spiritualism came up, it was something like a child's play. Exactly. You know, that, that she said would, would be a danger, an instrument in the hand of the devil, and we are seeing that now. The whole matter of the, the, the close relationship between the Protestants and Catholics. Mm -hmm. I tell you, you would be crazy to even imagine in that Protestants time. could ever... In yes. time. Let me give you an example. When America was forming, was being formed, the, 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 in the statement of independence, the Catholics were so few in number, and they were so degraded that they went to the president and asked, will Catholics be accepted? And the president said, yes, man, you're, you're welcome. Uh -huh. That's how much on the sideline Catholics were. But I know it tells you that the time is going to come when Catholics and Protestants will be united. And we're seeing it right before our eyes right now. It is a strong thing, you know, because America was formed by pilgrims. Protestants running away from the Catholic, from Catholic Church, Church, trying to find refuge away from them. So it was mainly Protestants. So the idea of Protestants going back to Catholics was a big no-no in America. But, but now, today, I, they are, everybody looks to walk out of church now. I, I, now the Supreme Court is filled with Catholic Church members. That's where America is now. And NY says this would have happened. And, so and you remember gone. that uh, Protestantism what gave rise to the uh, Reformation, yes. Martin Luther, yes. right? And, and, and so it's so important what you're saying uh, because I, I saw some of the nominal churches, the Protestant churches, a couple of years ago say, away with this now, we need to live together, right? So that's indeed one of the, the fulfillment of the prophets. Yes, one final one before we touch on that is yes. what she said about health. Yes. She made some very serious statements about tobacco, yes. you know, and about health principles that were mocked and jeered at. But now I'm smiling because I'm seeing even the advertisements on radio and television are endorsing what she says. I'll give you one more, Pastor Chambers. Remember the one about meat? She says that your plate should not be filled with meat. And at the time, everybody's meal at the time was a plate of meat. And she was like, no, this can't be healthy. Today, scientists and doctors are telling you, you can't eat a plate full of meat. You need your vegetables. You need this in there now to right. balance those. So Ellen White said some things that today, we are just accepting no they and seeing. They're being fulfilled. They're being fulfilled no. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry. I think Dr. Douglas said it earlier Why? about her testimony of, about Christ. Right. Right. Just to emphasize, if you read her about Desire of Ages, mm -hmm. you will see powerful testimony that this woman endorses Christ, she uplifts Christ, and speaks the truth about Christ. And finally, um, her, even her critics testify that this woman was a Christian. Amen. I tell you, I could read statements that's, upon statements. As like you know, uh, fruits of yes, the prophets. She did bear the fruit <laughs> yes. of what she testified. She wasn't perfect, but she did in her life bear that fruit. Amen. Amen, amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're saying that having looked at the test of the prophets, Ellen G. White passed the test. All of them. Fine All colors. of them. So, um, <laughs> as Seventh-day Adventists, no? We embrace her writing so much and so forth. But, but do we exalt her writing above the scripture? Or do you, where will you place her writing in light of the scripture? So it's important to understand that Ellen White, as Seventh-day Adventists, our only creed is the Bible. Right. There's nothing... You need to repeat that. <laughs> so as Seventh-day Adventists, our only creed is the Bible. Uh -huh. So even our fundamental statements are not creeds. It's our fundamental understanding, expressing words, what we think the Bible is trying to say to us. Yes. But the Bible is That's our only standard. That's why the reason our fundamental beliefs is based on the Bible too. It's based on the Bible. Right. And that's why every five years or so, we review the statement to see if we can find a better language to express our faith. Right. But our only creed is the Bible. So Ellen White does not replace the Bible. She does not supersede the Bible. And in fact, she says that if we study the Bible some more, we'd even need her writings. Mark you, we still need her writings. We're going to fulfill the remnant mission. So, so but she does say that. that. She said that if we understand the Bible clearly, and we won't need her writing. We wouldn't need her writings. So she really believes in the word of God. Yes. And she actually said that she, the Bible is the greater light, and she is the lesser light pointing to the greater light. So the Bible will always remain supreme. 
and therefore that's what we believe in. But matter of fact, if we exalt the Bible, her rising above the Bible, we will be disobeying her. <laughs> okay. Yes. And um, just an example, she even says that the whole idea of a preacher, because her writing is juicy, you know, it's, it's, it's good stuff, mm -hmm. but she discouraged the idea of a preacher taking up her books and bringing them into the pulpit to preach them. Yes. He doesn't encourage that. <laughs> she says, go to the scripture and wrestle with, it. wrestle with it. If you have to use a few quotations from her to support it, fine. But she, she discourages the idea of you depending on her writing. So for devotional purposes, you read the Bible. You, you might find inspiration from reading her books. I, I read through her books, but I go first to the Bible to make establish that foundation, and I read her writings to get enlightenment. And so, so uh, Pastor, you know, there are some individuals who will they, they'll uh, get into the pulpit and behind that lectern, they just preach Ellen White. Sometimes they don't even touch the Bible. It's just Ellen White quotation all the way, all right? And it's like some folk don't even bother too much with the Bible. They just focus on her writing. You're saying that that is not advisable. No, no. She, she says no. She says no. In fact, she had a problem with persons in her time who used to take some of our very, very harsh and harsh statements and use them out of context. Mm -hmm. And she said to them, listen, if you're going to really start quoting me like this, then why don't you talk about the love of God? Why don't you talk about loving each other? Why are you taking all of the hard texts out of their context and trying to bash persons with it? And then why it was advising persons in her own time not to do so. So therefore, we shouldn't be doing her like that. She's not the Bible. She is a guide. So sometimes when you read the Bible and you read Ed Andrew White, you might get a little, a little greater explanation or a little bit more in the story that you would not necessarily find in the Bible. She's actually pointing you back to the Word of God. The Bible should be your source. Which is one of the tests of the prophet, right? Yes. <laughs> believe the Bible, and she believes that. Yes. She directs us to it. Thank you. One example that I like to quote is uh, in the 1888 conflict over the righteousness by faith. The General Conference president wanted to settle the argument with Wagner and Jones. And so he sought for a quotation from Ellen White. Not, not a quotation, she, she, she asked Ellen White to fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, to tell this young man that they are wrong. And Ellen White says, no, matter of fact, she says that God had given her a vision and she forgot it and she is happy she forgot the vision because she wanted the church to go and study the matter for themselves from scripture the rather than using her authority to establish a doctrinal point. Somebody's asking it right now, is her writings inspired? And the answer to that is yes. The Holy Spirit inspired Ellen White to write. Just like how the Holy Spirit inspired John Revelator to write. So she is inspired. But her inspiration does not take precedence or superiority over the word of God. So how you, uh, thank you, having asked that and responded. Where, where will you place Ellen G. White uh, along with uh, Daniel and uh, Jeremiah and uh, those prophets, uh, major and minor prophets? Where would you place Ellen G. White what happened is that I think we, get, we misunderstand this concept where we think that once there's a prophet, we, we create prophets with scripture. scripture. There, are, there were prophets in the Bible whose writings did not come in the scripture. <laughs> they carry out a certain function and purpose. They accomplished God's will, but their writings were not part of the canon. And when they canonized it, they couldn't canonize everything anyway, right? Exactly. So, uh, so Ellen White's writing is not a third testament. Okay. <laughs> it is not an addition to the Bible. It is to exalt and lift up the Bible. God, the specific purpose was that the remnant church, under the circumstances she faced, needed clear light regarding what in, the scripture says because there was so much confusion about what scripture was saying and God used her to, to get, get his people to be in line with scripture. That's the main and, purpose. And, 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 and it, it makes sense. And at the beginning you say that uh, it's a medium by which God communicates with us. Yes. So if, if there was no more prophets after those Bible prophets, then it means that God would have gone on vacation, right? 
but he continues to communicate to us through prophets, just the same. And, and he made sure to tell us when he would do so. Yes. Because if we look at the Old Testament, there was no prophets after Malachi and Micah, those minor prophets. Yes. There was 400 years when there was no prophet. And the Maccabees, which we get the Maccabean Bible from, they said... That's the talk about the intertestament period. The intertestament period. period. Right. They said that in that time, there was no prophet of God. So they undertook to write the history of Israel because no prophet was there. And the intertestament period, ladies and gentlemen, is between the, the period between Malachi and uh, John, and the, John Baptist. the Baptist. Right. And John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. So then we have Matthew, and of course we end up with the last apostle that died um, on the Isle of Patmos, John. Mm -hmm. Then there was nothing again. And the Lord then predicted that after this appointment, they will prophesy again. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's the importance of the gift of prophecy. The Lord has to send a messenger to help shore up and help build up his kingdom at strategic points along the mission. Okay. So there's a biblical basis, Pastor Barrett, for having a prophet among the remnant. That's Not only in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, but in the text you quoted earlier, Joel chapter 2, mm -hmm. and then Malachi chapter 4 also says, God says, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Yes. And the text, both Joel and Malachi, when you, when you study them, you'll see that they, they had a partial fulfillment during John the Baptist's day and in the time of Peter, but there's a, there's a part to be fulfilled. For example, in Joel chapter 2, he spoke about the sun not giving her light, the moon not giving, and the star falling from heaven. Those things happen in our time, and so we're looking for a prophet. Exactly. And God has given us a prophet. So what, what was the purpose and function of the prophetic gift in New Testament time, and, and by extension, um, uh, the end of time? To be so I, I went through the different periods to give the audience an understanding of how the Bible and how God works. In the New Testament, it was used to initiate the church's mission. It was used to find and form the church. Ephesians 2 verse 19. Paul says it's used to edify the church. 1 Corinthians 14. He also says that it was to unite and protect the body. Because when you're going to have attack from outside, you're going to need something that will unite you and keep you together. Um, Ephesians 4. It warns of future difficulties. Yes. We have to know what's co coming on us so we can prepare for it. And it gives you the perfect gift before the second coming. And it, of course, identifies the remnant church. Those were the important way the New Testament used the gift of prophecy. And that's the same way we have to use the gift of prophecy. That, that's another reason why the Lord um, raised up Ellen White, because I know there's some tug of war at some point in time, right? Yes. And, yes. And because, go ahead. I'll give an example. They were looking at the Sabbath. The Sabbath didn't come from Adventists. It came from the Seventh-day Baptists. Uh, yes. Rachel Oaks. Mm -hmm. And when they were grappling with the Sabbath, trying to understand the Sabbath and see if they should keep it, because all of them were Sunday worshippers before. Mm -hmm. And they were studying, and they were studying, and they finally agreed that the Sabbath should be kept. It's at that time Ellen White got a vision where she saw the Ten Commandments and a light, the Four Commandments, lit up. And she said, yes, this is God's blessing. Mark you, her vision didn't tell them the Sabbath should be kept. It's only after they were studied and finished studying, then God said, yes, I'm now confirming that the Sabbath is important. And that's a beauty and the power of this gift in the Adventist church. Amen. In the Pastor. book of Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul said that God gave the church certain gifts to bring the church into unity and to help her to grow spiritually. And I tell you, the writings of Ellen G. White is doing just that for the remnant church. Mm. When you look at the book like Steps to Christ, Thoughts Sermon the Blessing, Christ of the Lesson, on issues such as dating and courtship for the young people, entertainment, evangelism, um, marriage and family, health. Her counsel is there to truly Amen. support the Seventh-day Church. And care for, you know, that's one of the things, you know, I say to people, if you, if you don't contend with her doctrines, if you, if you have a problem with her doctrines, contend with her counsels on evangelism, her counsels on marriage and family. Read those first and test to see the value 
of what? My life today is a blessing. <laughs> I, this month I'm celebrating 17 years in marriage and I never got any official counseling from any counselor. Ellen White's book, Adventist Home and Messages to Home People along with the Bible, those principles are eternal principles on which we can build solid relationships. So she is a counselor too, a prophet <laughs> counselor. <laughs> That's, that's I, wonderful. I tell people all the time, you know, when people are struggling with energy White, if you really want to, to start understanding this prophet, take one of her best little books ever written, Steps to Christ. Steps to Christ. Just read that little book, and you'll understand the power and the inspiration that God gave this young person. Yes. And then her life that provided the rich blessings that we have as Seventh-day Adventists. Let me tell you, uh, gentlemen, one of the things, I'm going to wrap up now. Our young people are ready in the rearing. We're going to wrap up so you can formulate your last statement. It'll be uh, what blessed promise can we find in God's word about the gift of prophecy. So why don't you just give us your last statement on that. But before we go there, uh, ladies and gentlemen and of yours, one of the things that want to call your attention to. If you were to read the Bible, for many, many individuals, they'll find the New Testament, the writings of Christ, uh, so easy to read. They're much simplicity, but it's profound, yes, yes. the word of, of, of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Now you read other books of the Bible, and sometimes it's kind of complicated, you know, some are serious. But you can easily understand, and uh, Christ used the language of the people and so forth, and so you could communicate with them clearly. It's the same kind of feeling you get when you read the writings of Amen. Ellen G. White. It's very simple and very profound. I want to encourage you to purchase the books. You can get uh, these books at our I had for bookstores, uh, they are there, Patriarchs and Prophet. Uh, that's a very interesting book. I mean, all the Bible stories, they come alive for your children. Everything you want, you can get them there. And this servant of God has helped to simplify the Word of God so that we all can understand, our children can understand. Surely she was a prophet of God. So tell us your closing statement, gentlemen. Well, for me, what, it, what I appreciate most about the work of Ellen G. White is that she helps to solidify our understanding of prophecy relating to the last days and the proclamation of the three angels' messages. Amen. The interpretation of Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, and Revelation chapter 13. I lament the fact that most Protestant churches, because they, you see, the Advent movement came out of the existing Protestant churches of the day who accepted the Millerite movement. But as soon as we face disappointment and so on, we abandon this, mm -hmm. the historicist view of interpreting prophecy. Ellen White, for the book Great Controversy especially, helps us to understand where we are as a people, the remnant church, and the reason we proclaim Revelation 14 verses 6 through the 12. She identified them, who the beast is, what the mark of the beast is, and clearly outlines for us who we are as a people. So we can't afford to neglect her writings at this time as we lose our sense of purpose and direction. Amen. One of my favorite texts when I'm dealing with Ellen White and the gift of prophecy is Second Chronicles 20, verse 20. The Bible says, Believe in the Lord your God, and so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. In this verse, we find two things. You believe in God, you will be established. You have a firm foundation on which to build. But if you believe the prophets, you shall now flourish, you shall now prosper. As a church, we believed in God. We were established on the word of God. We were established on the prophecies of God. We were established on the will of God. But the prosperity of our church happened when we believed the prophet that was sent by God. And it's from that we have flourished as a church to the point where Ellen White told her husband, James White, who was the then leader of the publishing house, that, hey, you're not, you need to start printing a little paper now, you know. You need to start printing and sending out. And it was that little message to her husband that led to the gospel being shared, even here in Jamaica. In Jamaica, Adventism didn't start because of a preacher. 
it started because of a book that was sent. That's the power of God. So, so shall we prosper. And that's the beauty of it, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Now, Dr. Chambers, you started out a while ago, and it tells us that we will have to have... Now, last week we had Dr. Dr. Gordon here, and we'll have to get back Dr. Gordon when he's back in the island for part two of that presentation. And this presentation, gentlemen, I'm, I'm extending invitation to you for part two of this very important. We're going to look at the spirit of prophecy. We talk about the gift of prophecy just now, right? We have to look at the spirit of prophecy. And you did talk about the preterist and the future, so we have to go dive into that. So in our next, in our next um, episode, we can look at some of those things. But thank you. Uh, gentlemen for coming. Thank you for sharing and uh, thank you our viewers uh, for joining us for talk priorities this afternoon. It has been a blessing having you sharing with us next week Sabbath afternoon at 3 hopefully 3 or 3.30 because you know we will be having baptism again uh, we'll have our Q&A segment and then we'll move into talk priorities again we're going to close with a word of prayer. We're going to ask uh, Pastor Chambers just say a word of prayer for us as we close this segment of our service. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for the powerful work of the Holy Spirit in and through the life of Ellen G. White, your last day prophet to the Remnant Church. We thank you, Lord, for this discussion we have had for Pastor Barrett, for his leadership and vision in putting together this program and for Dr. Douglas, for the online listeners and viewers who contributed. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful gift. May we never lose sight of the work of this lady to the church, the inspiration she has brought, the counsel, the guidance. Help us, Lord, to follow her counsel in sticking close to the Bible, in sticking close to the prophetic heritage that you have given to us at a church. And may we fulfill the call that you have given to us in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. Bless us to this end. Continue to bless this program, Talk Priorities. May it continue to, to edify your people and to glorify your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Enjoy our youth.
Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to my Adventist youth. Good afternoon to my Pathfinders and my adventurers. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to the Pomore Federation of Adventist Youth induction service for 2024. This afternoon, the Pathfinders and Adventurers will be lit. Yes, they'll be lit as they officially begin. I know some clubs may have begun already, but they'll officially begin their club year. Now, what's the induction service, you might ask? The induction service, that very special ceremony that really symbolizes the start of the Pathfinder year. So, the older members that are coming up in the classes, they get a chance to welcome the new members to the club. The Pathfinder Adventure Program admits children from as early as five years old when they start in the early bird class right up to the guide class 15 years old or older. This program is a very structured program that builds discipline and it inspires young people to learn about God and to give service to the church and their community. So it's a lot of excitement this afternoon as we go through this very special program. To begin our program this afternoon, We'll have the procession of our color party, and we'll also have very special music by our priest team.
Adventures pledge. <laughs> Pathfinder's pledge. Pathfinder's law. Adventures Law. A.Y. Song. Adventurers at home at school. 